sponsored by Dennis J. Courtney, MD, director of the Courtney Medical Group, located at 3075 Washington Road in McMurray, Pennsylvania. For more information or to make an appointment, call 724-942-3002. That's 724-942-3002. For Dennis J. Courtney, MD. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to AM Impact on Your Health. AM Impact on Your Health, where every day our goal is to have you learn at least one thing to help you live better and longer. AM Impact on Your Health, heard each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9 o'clock. I'm Dr. Dennis Courtney, and I'm with you each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9. AIM Impact on Your Health, where each day you'll find current medical news, knowledgeable guests, and fascinating health topics, and of course, where we do encourage you to call in to join in. Today, well, we have intended, and let's hope we can pull it off, um, to meet up with our good friend, Dr. David Brownstein. He was last with us two months ago. Uh, we are to discuss the issue of salt. Uh, do you try to avoid salt? Do you shun salt? Of course, you've been told to do so, more than likely by your doctor and with a little bit of sternness in the voice. How good is that recommendation? Is that really in your best health interest? Well, so says not. David Brown saying we'll be with him after our first break. Um, if we have any difficulty, we'll get into some issues on fiber. You, you of course, have been following, and uh, we may have an opportunity to open them up today. So uh, I tried to contact David just before I went on the air. Normally, I can get him. Uh, before we do our shows, uh, right before I take to the airways today, I could not. So I got a little question mark, and uh, I'll, I'll make do. Whatever happens, we'll do just fine. If in the course of our discussion with David, or if we have to move to switching some gears and change the format for today, of course, the number here, as always, is 412-825-6262. 412-825-6262. If our guest is David, of course, You'll be asking salt questions at any time. And if we switch our gears and move to another mode on other matters, well, we just open it wide up, and you'll find out my instruction at if we reach and when we reach that point. Now, up-and-coming shows, as it should uh, turn out next week, it'll be a hot one around here. Of course, we did stoke up the embers a bit a while back when, um, through the help of Edward Kane, we introduced this concept about fish oils being hazardous to your health. And they certainly are. And um, uh, really, at some point, if you take moderate amount of fish oils, moderate amount, uh, there is a consequence to pay for it. One of the um, other gentlemen in the country who's done his due diligence and who's done the work and the science, once again, I repeat, the science behind such recommendations is a gentleman I hope to introduce to you on Monday. I'm going to introduce him to you the entire week because He'll not just be here on Monday. He'll be there all three days next week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, because he's loaded with the science, and I want him to share that science with you on why fish oils are so doggone potentially harmful to your health. His name is Professor Brian Peskin. Um, they call him Pesky Peskin, and you'll find out why when you start to hear him on Monday. He's very acerbic. Uh, many say downright arrogant. Uh, but doggone it, I think he is so because he knows he's right. Hey, I hope you can handle him because the science I know you can handle, and that will be our topic next week on why the subject of fish oils has become the uh, the battleground that it has become better since I've introduced it. Hopefully all of you folks out there, my great listeners, who are still clinging to that bottle this morning, that bottle of fish oil, I mean, uh, maybe you can... Try your fingers off of that bottle just a bit to listen to the science with uh, Professor Brian Peskin. That's all next week. Then, of course, off air when I got off the, because uh, we've been doing our shows on fiber, which also, how about this, is and can be hazardous to your health. Uh, that was introduced to us by uh, Constantine Monastery. I hope you've enjoyed them. Uh, the guy is just loaded with one fact after another also. Uh, we just started to move because we got uh, so carried up on the issue of fiber that we really didn't do justice to the topic that we wanted to on Wednesday, and consequently, 
knowing that Mona Sturcy takes the, uh, the floor and is able to give us so many facts, we've allotted him two shows next week, or excuse me, the, third, the following week, on the 26th and the 28th. Uh, Constantine will be back with us. We'll be talking about, I think, the thing that leads it all, the thing that causes fiber to go in the negative direction for most individuals, and that is the issue of constipation, an honest discussion about it through a guy who has uh, given me more facts on fiber for sure, and as I read the issues of constipation that he writes about, uh, get ready, folks, strap the bell on. It's going to get a little bumpy around here. Okay. Now, the thing is going to come up, wind this up, and clean, conclude the end of the month of September. Uh, I'm looking here. As we move into the month of October, a couple things to report. Of course, Susan Smith-Jones will be back. She's going to be talking about weight loss. Don't forget her webinar today. Now, I'm going to guess it's still time for you to be able to cash in on that webinar and participate. Two o'clock today. I'm going to set my watch with a little note here to remind myself to dial her up to listen to her webinar at 2 o'clock today on weight loss. You'll have a chance to listen to her. You know her voice. You'll have a chance to see her. You probably have never seen her. Unless you've been on her website, you could be still photos. So I'm interested in uh, actually meeting um, her a little more intimately sort of still photos by watching her do her webinar today. 2 o'clock today. If you wanted to sign up, I think you still have time. You you go to SusanSmithJones.com. On the opening page, it says September Newsletter. Click on it. It will take you to the September Newsletter. And then about the third paragraph down uh, is the uh, information about the webinar. There's a place to click on to reserve a spot, to, to sign up, to enroll. Take care of that. And I'm pretty sure you'll be up and running quickly. Do it before the 2 o'clock this afternoon uh, encounter when Susan Smith Jones does her weight loss webinar. Of course, she's going to be talking about weight loss when she comes to our airways on the 4th of October, and you'll want to pay attention then. Uh, newly um, signed up guest for the month of October. We've met her once before. She has a heck of a story to tell about her own tribulations uh, and, and saga with respect to environmental uh, influences on her body in a negative way. Her name is Faye Houston. She's written a book. We talked about it once before. We're bringing her back. Silent Enemy, Environmental Illness, and a Woman's Search for a Cure. And this is one lady, and talk about people who have been, been immersed in alternative realms. I think there's not one single thing she has not. She's a professional um, devotee of everything alternative because she had to do them all to try to find her cure. She'll tell you what that cure is, by the way, on Monday. That's October 3rd. Then i got to mention MS, MSCG, not MSG, MCG is coming back, finally coming back. Uh, if you have been enrolled in MCG testing, of course, you know that stands for multifunctional cardiogram. And the multifunctional cardiogram device, we have procured it. It will be in the office. We're going to change. We had to change our September 8th testing date. We were involved with it to October 6th. So we are contacting you because we promised you we would to let you know about when we would be bringing the testing back. We promised you if you that time slot works. As many of you do work and you were, uh, you, they say that time slot works best for you. We've done our best to try to maintain that time slot that you originally signed up for again. And then, of course, we can now open it up to additional individuals. If you're interested in getting the MCG test done, which, as you should know by now, is a very simple, non-invasive test. It takes six minutes. From your perspective, it's just like getting an EKG done. In fact, from our perspective, as we perform it, it sure looks like an EKG to us. But this electronic machinery is able to assess 100 and 66 different data points. And when we finally get the results of the test, we are given a pretty good look as to the exact status of your coronary, ar coronary arteries, as though you might have had a cardiac catheterization. But of course, you won't have to have one. The MCG will suffice. And that's the beauty of that study. Insurance covers this test. 
for those of you who haven't heard about MCG, we'll do other shows on it uh, as time moves on. We've done many before, but you may be a new listener and are interested in your own status with respect to your cardiovascular health, and in particular, the status of those coronary arteries. But who in the heck wants to get a cardiac catheterization? Certainly not I. Okay, that's pretty much the way the schedule looks. Uh, Product-wise, of course, we want to keep on bringing to your attention the fact that we do carry. It's not difficult to keep here, but because you're responding, we do carry that replacement, that substitute. You've got to take the fatty acids. You must replace them. But as you now know, the replacement occurs in a specific ratio. You've got to have more omega-6s than omega-3s, but you must have a blend, and they must be of the parent oils. Parent oils meaning linoleic to alpha-linolenic. The linoleic category, which are omega-6s, is, is sunflower oil and uh, primrose oil, as well as for the omega-3s now, the alpha-linolenic component the parent oil is flax seed. You mix them together in a proper ratio, and they are parent oils, and they make all of the uh, fat contributions that you need for metabolic processes throughout your entire body and have the right uh, building blocks to rebuild that membrane, that cell membrane around every single cell you own. you got trillions of those cells, and uh, you turn them over about every 90 days. In fact, the, the you that you're looking at in the mirror today is not the real you of three months ago. All cells have completely changed. Every cell membrane had to be redone. If you don't provide the ingredients for the redo, you in big doo-doo, and uh, there will be a health consequence to pay for it. Okay. We'll, we'll probably really get into this when Brian Peskin comes with us uh, um, on the week of the 19th, 21st, and 23rd. Let's do this. We're going to take a short break. I'm going to go looking for David. Hopefully I'll find him, and we're going to be talking about salt. If not, we'll switch some gears and uh, switch this up. And I'll be back in a moment. See you then. This is Dennis J. Courtney, MD. Have you become confused about how best to manage your health? It's no wonder. It seems that every time you turn on the television or radio, another expert has yet another suggestion for you to follow that seems to be reasonable enough, but no matter how dutifully you follow the instruction, it just doesn't quite produce the results that you are looking for. If this confusion sounds familiar to you, give us a call at the Center for Complementary Health, where we'll make some sense of the confusion based on a blending of traditional and alternative medicine that we've been perfecting over the last seven years. We offer metabolic nutrition testing, immune system repair, natural hormone replacement therapy, chelation therapy, cutting edge allergy correction, and a host of other safe and effective alternative therapies. Dennis J. Courtney, MD, is located at 3075 Washington Road in McMurray. Phone 724-942-3002. Have you been to the doctor lately? Was fatigue top of your complaint list? Even if your doctor asks you what you eat, the recommended five servings of fruits and vegetables a day is a dream in your busy schedule. What if you learned of a product five years in the formulation that delivers five servings of fruits and vegetables in just one ounce? That's right. It's Fruits and Spirit. The blessings of Fruits and Spirit are now formulated into a delicious whole fruit puree product rich in antioxidants and minerals. Your health is more than just a test result. It's a balance of physical, spiritual, and emotional factors. You work regularly to strengthen your faith. Let Food the Spirit help cover your nutritional needs in a convenient and cost-effective ounce a day. Call 1-800-442-3793 for a special promotional offer. Fruit the Spirit, a blessing for your good health. Fruit of the Spirit, five servings of fruits and minerals with no added sugars. That's 1-800-442-3793. 442-3793 for your good health. Call them now, 1-800-442-3793. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back once again to AM Impact on Your Health. Heard here on KHB 620 each and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 to 9 o'clock. I'm Dr. Dennis Courtney with you today on a Friday version of the show. Slightly different. Whenever we can get this gentleman to come and spend some time with us on our airways, we always take the opportunity to do it. 
and Friday seemed to work out best for him. So uh, with that in mind, I'm really looking forward to bringing back a personal friend, a confidant, and a peer of, uh, of no equal with respect to his knowledge and medical acumen. He has an ability to put it down in the form of a book on so many topics. I often admire how well he does. With writing books, I can't seem to get one out. The man has nine, and I'm sure it's counting. There probably is a tenth in the office. He's a gentleman you all know. He's been to Pittsburgh many times, and he's uh, been uh, he presented one of our first conferences here. At the time, it was his first book. Well, many years later, and now at number nine, he's back with us again on the airways this time. His name, Dr. David Brownstein. Good morning, David. Thanks for coming aboard this morning. Good morning, Dennis. Thanks for having me. I, um, of course, uh, marvel once again over the nine. But by the way, is there a tenth book, David? In there the is office? a tenth book. The tenth book came out about a month ago. <laughs> so that's what you did in the month that you couldn't be here. You you put out another book. What? <laughs> what's the name of that book, David? That book is called The Soy Deception. Ah, The Soy Deception. Well, as uh, usually is the case, we'll schedule some time. We're going to talk about that soy deception at our next encounter. Is that fair? That sounds good to me. Okay. Let's get back to one of those earlier works. You've got so many of them. It's tough for you to recall them, I know. But uh, this is an issue that I commended you for at the time when you wrote the book. Uh, we've talked about it often um, face-to-face as well as on the air. But there's a perception out there in a the part of the public to avoid salt. You know it. You see it in your practice. I see it in mine. And the book that you wrote was so helpful because it finally brought the science into another area, another health scare that was a fallacy, that was a myth. And uh, we wrote a book about it entitled Salting Your Way to Health. Most listeners, at least uh, if they haven't heard of me before, are probably very clinical right now, wondering how could the two be Inclusive, salt and health just doesn't seem to go together. Or does it, David? Why don't you pick up on that point about salting your way to health instead of uh, uh, becoming unhealthy from salt? Well, Dennis, I've been using unrefined salt in my practice for nearly 20 years now, and um, it's an integral part of the practice. And I, I would say that using the right kind of salt in the right amounts is sort of a basic necessity for the body, just as uh, breathing and just as drinking water is. And um, unfortunately, conventional medicine has totally missed the mark on this. The media has missed the mark on this. And most people are misinformed and we're, we are trained from a young age up that salt is bad for you and we need to avoid salt. And if we all didn't need salt, we wouldn't have any hypertension and heart disease. And nothing could be further from the truth because even avoiding or even the ingestion of refined salt doesn't really change the hypertension risk nor the heart disease risk. But the 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 uh, big take-home message from salt is that our, our second major constituent in our body is salt, and we need salt for health. We need salt for our cells to maintain their 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 optimal functioning. And if we don't take in salt and the right kind of salt, uh, we set our bodies up for problems. Now you mentioned the term that uh, maybe the listeners aren't quite used to, but it really sets apart these divisions and the kinds of salt out there. You use the term refined and um, versus unrefined. Could you make that distinguish, distinction? Because that truly is where the difference lies. Because I don't think you're a big fan of the refined salt at all, because it's pretty toxic stuff. And most people, that's what they have sitting on their breakfast table right now. Could you take the opportunity to distinguish between refined versus unrefined and what that means? Well, the, let's, let's take that one step backwards. And when I see a new patient in the office and I ask them, you know, what kind of salt and how much salt they're ingesting, invariably, if they're somewhat knowledgeable on holistic principles, they'll say, well, I'm eating healthy. I eat uh, sea salt. And for me, the term sea salt means nothing. All salt came from the ocean at some point in its lifetime. And all salts could be classified as sea salt. doesn't matter if we're talking refined or unrefined, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so the term sea salt does not mean a healthier salt, does not mean an unhealthier salt. It means nothing. It just means salt. So I took, I've taken that a step further to differentiate between refined and unrefined salt. 
So most of us are familiar with refined salts. Re the refining of salts uh, removes the minerals that are naturally associated with salt. It, uh, they add iodine to the salt, and they, in the refining process, the salt has contaminants in it. And refined salts can have ferrocyanide, aluminum silicate, dextrose, um, and then some other chlorine derivatives as they try and bleach it white. So the refined salt that we're all familiar with is the the girl with the umbrella, the, you know, and the blue can. That's Morton stuff. I use the word Morton's. Morton salt. Uh, you know, there's other salts out there, and they're they're pretty much at every restaurant around the country, and the little salt shakers. And this refined salt is very fine. It can go through real small holes, which is, uh, you know, they've trained us to believe that this is the best salt out there. Well, what I tell my patients is the salt is white, and Generally, if the salt is very fine and can go through those small holes, you can assume that it's refined salt and you should avoid that stuff. Now, I contrast that with unrefined salt. And unrefined salt has its full complement of minerals attached to it from wherever the salt was harvested from. And because it's got minerals in it, that salt is thicker. It won't pour through small holes. And, and also because it has minerals in it, that salt has color to it because minerals have color to them. And depending on where the salt is harvested from, the mineral color can be different. Um, some unrefined salts have a grayish color. Some have a reddish color. Um, but the key points that I try and make to my patients is to, let's all use the right terminology, refined salt versus unrefined salt. Then we all know what we're talking about. And really, patients should stick with unrefined salt. It's, it's, it's uh, the mineral content in it is... Uh, you know, a plus for the body, and it's in a very easy, easily absorbable form of, uh, uh, the, the salt has an easily absorbable form of minerals in it. And um, my experience has been clear that uh, unrefined salt does not cause hypertension, unrefined salt does not cause heart disease. In fact, those with hypertension will see their blood pressure lower when they add unrefined salt in due to the mineral content. And um, there are only a very few people that are salt sensitive people and salt sensitive to unrefined salt, and that is few and far between. Um, the vast majority of patients can and thrive on unrefined salt and need unrefined salt, and the and simple blood tests can differentiate that. Now, you brought in a new concept that, uh, that I want to make sure that I hone in on, that you, you perked up my, uh, my antenna up right now, because you say just because something's called sea salt, that doesn't necessarily mean it has the, 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 the minerals that you're looking for. In fact, I think the distinction that you now make is that that salt that you're using is white. You know, white is the driven snow, beautiful white. Then you really probably don't have a healthy form of salt at all. You have a refined salt in some way, shape, or form. Is that is that the message I could take out of what you said a moment ago? That's absolutely the message you can take out. And what I try and convince... Uh, um, doctors when I lecture to them or lay people when I lecture to them is to, let's all use the right terminology. So, uh, you know, I like giving lectures and, um, you know, when I start talking about salt, someone will ask me, well, what about sea salt? And I always will correct them. Are we talking about unrefined salt or refined salt? And that, those are the two terminologies. So, Morton's table salt could be classified as sea salt since it came from the ocean. It is refined sea salt, but it's sea salt. And so that term sea salt has been misused, and if you go to the grocery store and see just a label of sea salt, you don't know what that is. It has to be an unrefined salt, and, you know, examples of unrefined salt can be uh, Salinas, Celtic brand sea salt, um, Himalayan sea salt, um, Redmond sea salt. Those are examples of unrefined salt that I've used in my practice, found them very helpful. I've tested these three, vers these three versions of salt uh, for contamination and found that they have not been, in the batches that I tested were not contaminated. Um, I tested the Redmond's brand salt three times. I tested the uh, Salinas Celtic salt brand four times and the Himalayan salt twice. And they all came up as clean versions of salt and with good mineral contents to them. Absolutely a salient point because I'll tell you what, uh, to see the word sea salt, I think that does trigger in the mind of the, uh, of the individual, oh, this is the stuff that, that David's referring to. This is sea salt. No, no, no. If it's white, 
It ain't right. How about that one? I like that. Uh, <laughs> I, I like the power that from you, Dennis, and I won't give you credit for that. If it's what, you will give me credit when you say I will give you credit. Ah, <laughs> if it's right, it ain't right. Speaking of that ain't right stuff, one other concept I'll ask you, because it, it parlays off of your first book, and that's the issue of iodine. You know, iodine really isn't in even the uh, unrefined salt. It's just absent. And, and, um, and so Morton's was encouraged to put that stuff in there. But the amount of iodine, I'd like to spend just a moment on it, because you're the one that educated me on the content. Thinking that you can get your iodine through salt is a bad thing to think because even if it contains iodine, called something called iodized salt, the amounts, talk to me about the minuscule amounts, the poultry amounts, you cannot get the iodine you need through that form of salt. Could you spend a moment on that? Well, there, there, is, there is a little more iodide in refined salt, but it's not much. And when, you know, my research has shown that only 10% of the iodine in salt and refined salt is absorbable. Um, it's not a great way to get iodine in the body. And if you couple that with our toxic world we live in and our increasing exposure to toxic chemicals that push more iodine out of the body, our iodine requirements have gone up dramatically over the last 30 years. And really, the argument that we can use refined salt to get enough iodine in our body does not hold weight. So. Um, you're right, Dennis. Unrefined salt does not have much iodine in it. It has trace amounts in it, and it's certainly not enough for our body's uh, needs and, and uses. So what I recommend people do is to use unrefined salt as part of a holistic treatment regimen, and not even a holistic treatment regimen, just a, just a healthy daily regimen, and then to supplement separately with an iodine supplement. Absolutely, and you got to take the two. You can't get your the iodine you need through salt at all, whether it's refined and say that it's in there, or unrefined and just have traces of them out. It's just not enough, and I'm glad I asked the question. Speaking of questions, I think we may have one from a listener. Do you mind taking one early, David? I would love to. Hey, out there, come on the story. You're with Dr. David Brownstein. Go right ahead. What's your question? Good morning, Dr. Courtney. I was wondering what Dr. Brownstein's take was on kosher salt. Huh. I'm sure he'll be able to answer it. What do you think about kosher salt, David? It's a good question. Uh, I'm asked that pretty much at every salt lecture that I give. Kosher salt is a refined salt. The minerals are removed. Um, it's not what we're talking about here. And um, if you're keeping kosher in your house, uh, Selena's Celtic salt is certified kosher. And I believe Redmond is. I'm not sure about Redmond. Um, but... Um, so kosher salt is not the salt we're talking about. I would classify kosher salt as a refined salt. Very good question. Great answer, especially for the Jewish community out there where that it really is a big factor. So you say Redmond's is considered, because it gets some certification, right? If something's kosher or not. Celtic salt is certified kosher. I'm not sure about Redmond's salt. Okay, Celtic uh, is. I believe it is, but I'm, I'm not sure about that one. Okay, there you go, ma'am. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh-huh. Wonderful question. Thanks for taking it, David. A little out of sequence. That was an early one. Um, you went and did a lot of research when you wrote your book, and uh, the low salt or no salt, actually, I, I think no salt is probably even a fair statement to make. The conventional medical community rammed this at us, rammed it, continues to ram it down our throats, even to this very day, about low salt diets. In your book, is just replete with evidence, investigative evidence, research papers on the fact that low salt diets are quite harmful. I'll let you take it, David, because you can go through a litany of the investigation that you did to reveal that low salt diets are absolutely harmful to you, and this would fly in the face of the conventional thought processes that the conventional doctors are trying to make us believe where salt is considered to be verboten and not to be ingested. How bad are low-salt diets? Low-salt diets are a disaster for patients. Uh, there's, there's no benefit to them whatsoever. They, they result in increases in cardiovascular disease. They result in increases of cancer. Uh, they result in more mineral deficiencies. And they're, they're, they're worse 
Well, low salt diets are worse than eating refined salt. I, you know, salt is such a basic ingredient to our body. We need enough sodium and chloride to run thousands of different reactions in our body. The low salt diet is just a recipe for disaster. Um, so you asked me about uh, the the conventional side of this. Well, you know, I had been using salt in my practice for about 10 years before I wrote my salt book. And what prompted me to write that book was that I was finishing my first edition of my iodine book. And in the Detroit Free Press, uh, every Tuesday there was a health section, and it was not really much about health. But it was about usually the next the new drug that came out or hospital procedure or something like that. Well, in, in this health section, there was a national column written by a nutritionist. And this nutritionist, about 10 years ago, was asked a question, is there any difference between uh, sea salt and, um, what was the other term they used, uh, refined salt they must have used. Uh, um, and so her answer was, no, there's no difference. They contain equal amounts of sodium and chloride, and they're equally dangerous for the body, and they both should be avoided uh, and minimized in the diet. Well, I was near the tail end of my iodine book. I got irritated about that answer, and I cut it out, and I pasted it over my computer, and I looked at that for the next month or so while I was finishing the book. And as soon as I finished my iodine book, this nutritionist gave me the impetus and the idea to write about salt. And that's truly where that idea came from, to, that's to how it write started. that book. That's how because it started. Because I had been using it 10 years, and I knew the benefits of it. So when I, when I really looked into the research of uh, this myth that salt equals hypertension, that salt equals heart disease. Um, there's one study that you come back to, and it, it took a little pulling in the literature to find it, but it's called the InterSalt study. It was done in the 1970s, early 1970s. It was a government-funded study of uh, 20, maybe 22 different countries were involved, and you know there were sites all over the world. And what they looked at was the salt intake of the population and the development of hypertension. And so what they found was that of the, I might have my numbers off a little bit, of the 22, it might be 22 or 25 uh, area studies, but uh, of the 22 different countries studied, they found four were found, four areas were found to have a direct correlation with salt intake and the, the development of hypertension. The other 18 areas around the world there was no correlation. Some had high salt intake, some had low, and there was no correlation with development of hypertension. So the four areas that they found that had the correlation with hypertension, they found the lower salt intake of these four areas in these populations had almost no hypertension. So the, the, article, the, the article read that uh, this is the smoking gun showing that low salt intake equals low hypertension and the Surgeon General of the United States seized on it, and he went on TV and said, we all lowered our salt intake to almost nothing. We have no hypertension and no heart disease in our country. And really, that's where the momentum started behind it. Ah, uh, the so, Surgeon General at the time. Who was it? You know, I don't remember who it was at the time. But when I pulled the article, it's called the InterSalt Study, and I talk about this in my book. Those four areas that had very low salt intake and low hypertension were non-acculturated populations. They were jungle, pop, jungle people. And one of them was, they were all from South America. And I think three from South America, one from Africa. And they were non-acculturated, you know, they lived in the jungle. And um, one of these populations I was familiar with, it was the Yananamo Indians. And the Yananamo Indians I studied at the University of Michigan. We had an anthropology professor who wrote books on the Yananamo Indians and papers and so he taught us, who took, those who took anthropology, about the Yananamo Indians. Well, I knew very well that the Yananamo Indians did not live to an old age. They all died around age 50. So the idea that eating a low-salt diet uh, does not give you hypertension doesn't really hold true here because these people didn't live long enough to develop hypertension. They died in their 40s. And, um, and then the other, the other argument against this is that Really, out of the 18 westernized areas they looked at, there was no correlation between salt intake and hypertension and heart disease. It was only these non-acculturated populations who didn't live to an old age. And so I don't think you can make any conclusions on these four populations except for these perhaps eating a low-salt diet results in you die at a young age. 
Um, so the the information that the Surgeon General presented at the time I thought was skewed and not tr truthful. And then recent studies have come out. I'm sure you've seen some of these, Dennis. There were, I think, three studies that came out in the last six months showing n no correlation with uh, salt intake and development of hypertension and heart disease. And in fact, one or two of those studies recently showed that the low salt diets were associated with more cardiovascular disease and more all-cause mortality. So the literature is really clear when you start looking at it that there's no association with, there's no claim to be made that low salt diets equal better health and they actually equal worse health or worse cardiovascular health. Now in, in keeping with that thought, on the last time we had our discussion, by the way, it was on July 7th. And on that day, it was just uncanny, I was looking at my newspaper and uh, this article hit my newspaper on that day. You actually uh, commented on it. I'm going to bring it to the attention because the, the, the research is now finally coming out to back up exactly what you've always said. On that day, uh, there was an article that was published in my paper coming from a gentleman at the University of Exeter in Britain, Rod Taylor. He published an article on American General Hypertension. I'm going to just read that little sentence here about the findings. They say that uh, they, they identified seven studies involving 6,257 adults with normal or high blood pressure who reduced the amount of salt in their diet. And when they pooled the data to conduct a meta-analysis, a large study analysis of, uh, of those seven studies, the research concluded they found no clear evidence that cutting salt uh, in, the, uh, in, in the diet cut the chances of dying from heart disease or dying from any other reason, and although it didn't support the fact that you just mentioned, newer research is showing you will actually be in great harm if you reduce your salt. The literature is getting clearer and clearer about the fact that salt absolutely is it to cut your low salt, to cut and reduce the salt in the diet, is does not have any great benefit to you. So consequently, uh, the the, the uh, Maybe it's going to change, David, I guess is the point I'm getting to, that maybe the conventional doctors in another, what, 25 or 30 years, it takes so slow, maybe we'll cut the battle cry that was hallmarked by a Surgeon General. I didn't realize that. By a Surgeon General over a number of uh, generations ago, probably at least at a minimum, too. Well, you're right, Dennis, and I think you're being generous by saying 25 to 30 years because you've seen how slow medicine can move. And um, you know, medicine with its with its long focus on you know the reliance on drug therapies, um, just is incredibly slow to change. And you know, I always I always uh, give the story back to Semmelweis from the 1800s, where he uh, suggested that this was before they knew about germ theory and bacteria and viruses, and he felt that the high mortality of infants and mothers, and you know, when they delivered babies was due to transferring something from one mother to the next as they were delivering the babies because what they used to do was look to line the mothers up in beds and they would go deliver one baby, go deliver the next baby and the next baby and they wouldn't wash their hands in between. And the infant mortality and maternal mortality was over 50% at that time. Um, so Simmelweiss did a study where he put a bucket of water between the beds. He delivered a baby, put his hands in the bucket of water for 10 seconds, delivered another baby, put his hands in a bucket of water, and so on. And his mortality rate went down from the average of uh, 60 or 70 percent to to 10 percent. And so he wrote about it. He said perhaps doctors should wash their hands between deliveries. And at that time he wrote that, he, there was an outrage from the medical community. They said he was wrong. They took, they, I don't know if they had a license back then, but they wouldn't let him practice medicine anymore. And the story is that he died a broken man, and uh, uh, he was put in an insane asylum after that. And it took medicine 60 years to change to 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 understanding the importance of washing your hands between deliveries. So I think that you're a little generous in saying maybe I am. Five years for salt. I think it'll be much longer than that. <laughs> it's not usually like me to be so generous with respect to the conventional community. I take it back. I withdraw it. It'll be a hundred years plus. A hundred years. I would agree with hundred years. A <laughs> hundred years. Look, why don't we do this? Let's take a short break. Out there. Uh, oh, by the way, I think there's a questioner. Uh, before we go, uh, is there somebody out there want to come in and ask the doctor a question? Go right ahead. 
yes. I wondered if you ever tested the Redmond real salt. It has all the uh, trace mineral minerals. Thanks. I'll hang up and listen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. She thinks that Redmond evidently is the one that has all the traces. Can you set it straight, David? I have tested Redmond salt twice. It tested clean, and it did have a high mineral content. I I agree. I think Redmond is a good choice for an unrefined salt. Yeah, I know you mentioned in your book you're very much behind it as well as the Celtic. Uh, the Himalayan, I think you just mentioned it, you never, you, you, but you've now, in the meantime, have checked it, I think you said twice, right, Himalayan salt? i checked it twice, and the only, you know, my only reticence about Himalayan salt is the price is three times as high as Redmond salt or Celtic salt. And I see, from my testing, I see no, absolutely no reason to spend three times the money on Himalayan salt that you can get uh, the same mineral content in either Redmond or the Celtic brand sea salt. What is that thing with the candle and the light that, with the red Himalayan salt? The red, do you know what I'm talking about? There's some no, sort there, of there was a Japanese gentleman <laughs> who who did some studies and uh, you know I, I they were very uh, in my mind foo fooey studies. I didn't really put a lot behind uh, his writings with that and. Um, I just looked at the mineral content from my uh, laboratory analysis of the salt and, and the metal content of the salt and made those claims. And I, and I just felt like the, red, the Himalayan salt was not worth three times the price. All right. We're going to take that break. So it's, uh, it's coming together, folks, for the first time in maybe a month. Salt is not hazardous to your health. Everything else is. Salt's not. We're going to be back with the author in a moment. By the way, get ready. Pencil and paper. We'll give you information on our return of how you get your hand on these books yourself. Be back in a moment with Dr. David Brownstein. This is Dennis Shea Courtney, MD. Have you become confused about how best to manage your health? It's no wonder. It seems that every time you turn on the television or radio, another expert has yet another suggestion for you to follow that seems to be reasonable enough, but no matter how dutifully you follow the instruction, it just doesn't quite produce the results that you are looking for. If this confusion sounds familiar to you, give us a call at the Center for Complementary Health, where we'll make some sense of the confusion based on a blending of traditional and alternative medicine that we've been perfecting over the last seven years. We offer metabolic nutrition testing, immune system repair, natural hormone replacement therapy, chelation therapy, cutting-edge allergy correction, and a host of other safe and effective alternative therapies. Dennis J. Courtney, M.D., is located at 3075 Washington Road in McMurray. Phone 724-942-3002. Want to help your family eat healthier? Instead of learning to disguise tofu in wondrous ways, how about some real nutritional power? If your family has the typical American palate for fries, pizza, and burgers, giving your family the blessing of good nutrition is a struggle. Fruit of the Spirit is the answer for your family's nutritional needs. Fruit of the Spirit is an all-natural whole fruit puree made from fresh fruits native to the Holy Land with alkalizing you minerals. Get, you Fruit of the Spirit orders. with five years in the formulation, the work of a team of top Here's nutritional out. experts with independent science to confirm its antioxidant power. One ounce a day provides the equivalent of five servings of fruits and minerals. Fruit of the Spirit is convenient, affordable, and delicious. Even your picky family will sing the praises of Fruit of the Spirit. Give I'll your loved ones the blessing of good nutrition. Call 1-800-442-3793 for a special promotional offer. Fruit the Spirit, a blessing for your good health. That's 1-800-442-3793. Call them now, 1-800-442-3793. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back once again to AIM Impact on Your Health here on a Friday morning version of the show, slightly different than our normal Fridays. we got a fantastic guest with you today, uh, a knowledgeable doctor, a friend of mine who uh, Pittsburghers have become enamored with because, uh, well, he's, he's able to, to take these difficult scientific concepts and bring them to a easily a, a level of easy understanding. You can tell by his voice. You can tell by his explanations here. You can tell by his books, his name, Dr. David Brownstein. David, could you take a moment and tell our listeners how they can get a hold of now a tenth book, okay? All ten are available, I'm guessing. Uh, but go ahead, let our listeners know how to get their hand on this stuff. 
I think they need it as uh, uh, at least in the iodine book we've covered so far, and the salt book. Well, we've got many more to cover, and we're going to cover the soy deception next. But go ahead, tell them how. So they can they can order the books or DVDs from my website, which is uh, www.drbrownstein.com. D R Brownstein B R O W N S T E I N dot com, or they can call eight 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 six four seven five six one six. Okay. Uh, once again, that number because if you're writing, they may have missed it. Okay. Go ahead, David. One more time. Eight eight eight. Six four seven five six one six. Okay, I, I suggest you head to the website, folks. First, there's so many uh, books, and um, rather than going through the list of them so quick without doing them justice, I'll just say that before too long, we will have gone over all those books here. I really just think, uh, David, you help out so much when it comes to whatever you write about. You get the research behind it. You've read it in a simple way. This is a book that uh, a doctor can understand, but a non-doctor easily could understand as well. And I, I salute you for your ability to write in such simple language. Thank you, Dennis. Now, um, with respect to salt, folks, uh, we're finding out this one you need. Okay, the fish oil, uh-uh. Fiber, pretty problematic. Salt, boy, do you need it in your diet. Uh, and uh, the one of the areas in your book that I thought was interesting, uh, and I'm going to ask you to talk about it now, is the relationship between salt and specific organs in the body one particular organ that you paid a lot of attention to when you wrote your book, uh, and maybe you can lay some groundwork for our listeners right now, is the relationship between salt and the adrenal glands. Everybody comes to me and literally telling me that they have exhausted adrenal glands, adrenal exhaustion. So they're aware out there in the street that the adrenals play a role in exhaustion. How does salt play a role with the adrenals? And maybe there's a tie in here. Go ahead. Well, you know, I see the same patients you see, Dennis, and people are tired and achy and brain fogged and, you know, no energy. And the adrenal glands, which sit in the, in the kidneys in the back, um, are responsible for releasing hormones that help to give us energy to go do whatever we want to do during the day. If we want to exercise, give us, energy, give us the hormones, you know, with the, giving us the ability to exercise or just walk around or work or whatever we have to do. So under periods of constant stress or anxiety or, you know, mineral depletion or whatever, the adrenal glands can become stressed out and slow their production of their hormones down. The end result on somebody is that they're tired and achy, brain fog, not feeling well. And, you know, adrenal exhaustion is just a, a common complaint that patients are presenting with and that we're diagnosing patients with. Um, now, What's not real, really well known by the conventional doctors is the adrenal glands are exquisitely sensitive to salt, and they release a hormone designed to ensure that we have adequate amounts of salt and sodium in our bloodstream because we have to have hundreds of grams of sodium just to survive and to to maintain our blood pressure and to run chemical reactions and you know to use throughout the body in every single cell. So this one hormone is aldosterone, and then through a complex series of, of chemical reactions, aldosterone released from the adrenals results in uh, sodium uptake by the kidneys, so it's not, uh, so we don't pee it out. In periods of low salt intake, um, the body's trying to conserve what low sodium that there is out there, and it will release more aldosterone to, to conserve the sodium that's, you know, so you don't pee it out. And the secondary side effects of that is that blood pressure will go up. Now, the treatment for this in many cases is give them salt. Um, and my experience has been that in treating somebody with salt, um, the adrenal fatigue syndrome that many people have simply you know, hopefully goes away or it gets markedly better. And really treating these people with salt is sort of an integral part of their treatment regimen for anyone with adrenal problems. And, um, you know, I found it very difficult to reverse adrenal, uh, hypoadrenal symptom, symptoms without using uh, unrefined salt. An extremely important comment you just made because 
the, the people that come in and, and talk to me and say they're adrenal exhaustion, they've made a connection between cortisol production that they have that they don't even know about aldosterone. One of the three there's three big hormones that come out of these this land. And uh, they're aware of cortisol. You know, when they do studies, they get the, the diurnal changes in cortisol. Uh, you do saliva testing to find out what those ranges are. But nobody's checking aldo aldosterone. And so you make a very important part, a point, rather, that you can't really correct adrenal exhaustion without correcting for aldosterone also, not just cortisol. You know, Dennis, it's interesting that if you read a lot of the holistic literature, they will, these doctors will write that, um, these patients have high cortisol levels. Well, I'm sure you're seeing the same patients I'm seeing, and I don't see that many people with high cortisol levels, very few. Um, I'm sure you're seeing the same. I see them in the basement. The cortisol levels go through the yes. basement. Yes, cortisol levels are low or they're normal. You don't see high cortisol levels very rarely. And this idea that high cortisol level is causing uh, breast problems and breast cancer and uh, um, fatigues and chronic fatigue and all this, and estrogen imbalance, it's just not true. And that has not been my experience. And when I talk to other who, other doctors who are looking at this, nobody's seeing this. So I think that's a misnomer. I think we've missed it. And we missed it because people are salt deficient. And um, that has thrown their adrenal glands off. And what that's going to do is drop the adrenals to a lower state of functioning. And this lower state of functioning is going to include low cortisol levels, just like you said, in the basement. And these people need salt, and salt can be an amazing, uh, amazing part of their treatment regimen, you know, where it helps them out almost immediately when they increase their unrefined salt intake. Wonderful find, doctor. Just wonderful. And it's, it's the missing link. It's never considered by our colleagues, and it really is downplayed by myself. And I thank you very much for pointing it out. Listeners, I hope you pick up on this. Uh, start treating yourself or what you think might be adrenal exhaustion right now by just getting the right amount of unrefined salt. Hey, we got another listener. Come on the store. You're with Dr. David Brownstein. Go right ahead. What's your question? Yes. Uh, my mother suffers from uh, congestive heart failure, and uh, if, if she eats too much sodium, uh, her ankles will swell up. And uh, is Great that question. Is to the rule of uh, the, the, the salt intake? Great question on fluid retention, David. Uh, congestive heart failure patients are absolutely self-restricted. Can you uh, take a moment and shed some light on this because it's a question that never got asked before, and I think it's a key question. It is a good question, and I, you know, I wanted to bring this up at the end if it didn't come up. The one group of people, that, there are two group of people that you have to be careful with, you know, markedly increasing their salt intake, whether we're talking refined or unrefined. One of them is congestive heart failure, and the other are kidney failures. Um, if they're not in kidney failure and they don't have congestive heart failure, the kidneys have been trained to pretty much deal with low salt environments as well as very, very high salt environments, higher than any of us will ever ingest, and it's just generally not a problem. For those with kidney problems and congestive heart failure problems, they need to be careful with how much salt they intake. Now, they should, if any salt they intake, they should take unrefined salt, and they do need, they do need unrefined salt in their diet. You need some amount of salt in the diet just to survive. But um, they should get the right kind of salt, which is unrefined salt, but they're going to have to experiment with small amounts and um, make sure their kidneys are able to handle the load and, um, uh, you know, and go up from there and not just immediately go to, you know, an average dose of salt that I talk for most people without those conditions is about a teaspoon throughout the day. And that, that, is, that assumes people are drinking adequate amounts of water. Um, but for, for those type of patients, they need to just be a little more cautious with it and go a little slower with it and just monitor things. Okay, that, that's fine. Great question, and uh, it's nice to hear, David, that you actually have an amount. I think that uh, what we got two people doing is if you have congestive heart failure, you take no salt when, in fact, you need at least, you say, a teaspoon a day, or experiment, bring it up, try to get to that level. I think it's a real great answer to a very problematic uh, issue out there in the medical uh, world and, and the patients who suffer from congestive heart failure, especially as they are so elderly, it is a, a problem and I think you handled it well. Thank you very much for the question. Okay, got another question, David. Here it comes. Go right ahead. You were Dr. David Brownstein. What's on your mind? Go right ahead. Hi, I just have a quick question. I have two different 
containers of salt here, and neither one of them say refined or unrefined. So well, how, how do we find out? Well, what's the name? What's the name of the salt? The what's the name of the salt? What's the brand? One is called Himalayan pink salt. Okay. The other one is called Mediterranean sea salt. So here, here's what I would, here's how I, uh, here's how I would ask you the questions. Uh, is there some color to the salt, or is it pure white? Uh, the Himalayan is pink. So that would be a hint to you that that's probably an unrefined salt, and it, the, the pink color is the minerals in it. And I can tell you the Himalayan salt is an unrefined salt. And it is pink. And it is, it is, you know, there is Himalayan pink salt. So, so they that's don't an put that on salt. the label though, whether it's refined or unrefined. You know, they don't, they don't use those terms. Um, the the Celtic salt label does say somewhere in the back there's a bunch of writing that talks about being unrefined. Um, but they really don't use those terms on the label. So you, you, we need to use those terms when we talk to each other. But really, the way you can, the way, one of the ways you can tell is the color of it, just as you looked at that. And the other way is, if it's sick and not likely to pour through those small holes of those small salt shakers that are in all the restaurants, generally that's another sign that could be an unrefined salt. That's not always a, a hard and fast yes to that question. But, uh, because I think this Mediterranean salt, even though it's coarse, it's white. So I think that's probably hard right. to say what that is. But you generally, if it's white, like uh, you know, like yes. like the snow, like Dennis said, then generally it's a uh, um, uh, refined salt. If it's white, it ain't right. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Great question right at the end. We got bongos going off in the background. David, as usual. You stole the show today. Your your information was very valuable, our listeners. We look forward to enough air. We're, you and I will get together and find out when we're coming back, talking about that soy deception, folks. That'll be the next one. I'll oftentimes and throughout the week give you the numbers and uh, how to reach the to buy David's books once again. So until Monday, we're going to have Dr. Brian Peskin with us. This is Dr. Dennis Courtney with Dr. David Brownstein saying so long for an impact on your health. Impact on Your Health is sponsored by Dennis J. Courtney, M.D., Director of the Courtney Medical Group, located at 3075 Washington Road in McMurray, Pennsylvania.